turn to Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, and it's interesting to me how the Lord works. Um, they were, Vines were actually scheduled to sing a few weeks ago, and Brother Micah had some heart uh, concerns and things that God worked in and provided for, and uh, that song I had given them and didn't realize, I forgot about the phrase, uh, Lord, and uh, that's what we're going to look at tonight, so God put that together, and a great truth in song tonight. Genesis chapter 15, if you will, join me in standing, and let's look at a few verses together, beginning in verse number one of this great chapter, and God teaching and revealing things to Abraham. I hope you've been enjoying our study. It seems like we've, it kind of goes through waves, but we, at times it's more principle or precept based, and then lately we've just been all kinds of character studies where you see godly principles fleshed out in real people's lives. And we're kind of in that season, it seems like right now, and I hope it's been a blessing. But tonight we're going to look <laughs> at the life of Abraham and some things he learned about a special name of God uh, that I hope will become more special and precious to you. Let's begin in verse number one. After these things, the word of the Lord, all right, L-O-R-D, came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, notice l lowercase o, lowercase r, lowercase d, God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham, verse 3, said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of, out of Ur of the Chaldees to give, un, give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, notice, capital L again, lowercase o-r-d, God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it. And in verses 2 and 8 of our text tonight, we find the first occurrence of the word Adonai. And tonight we want to study about this name of God. We've talked about Elohim. We've talked about Jehovah, two of the grand names of God that we'll come back to with some of the compound names of God. But tonight, this special name, Adonai, Lord, and I hope tonight God will challenge your thinking. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the joy it is to gather tonight. And Lord, thank you for strength and provision in this day. And Lord, all the conversations and relationships and interactions we've had with you and with your people and guests you've sent our way. Father, I pray tonight as we meet around your word that your name, this name, Adonai, would be lifted up in our hearts and minds. And that, Lord, as a result, we would lower and humble ourselves before you, submit ourselves to who you are. Bless this study, be honored in how it's preached and heard and how we each live it out this week. And we will thank you and praise you as our Lord in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, as you're being seated tonight, I don't see them in our ranks, I guess. No, yeah, I see a couple of them back there. Uh, Miss Teresa. Miss Teresa, am I right? The initials of your children are all the same. Is that correct? All right. My, my son, I want to confirm that before I said that publicly. I just embarrassed her by asking her. But anyway, my sons were telling me that all of their daughters, did you realize this, that all of their daughters are C? is their first name, their last name is T, and all of their middle initial is A, right? Miss Teresa, is that right? So, you know, Brother Allen, as he walks around, I can talk about him and his cats, you know, they're just kind of, you know, I don't know what that evokes in your mind, but that seems to run counter some of who Brother Tolles is, but it, it, every one of them, their names, the first name is C, I don't know why I've never thought of this before, middle initials A and last name, obviously, Tolles is T, so C-A-T. Do you know that names matter? And I doubt that that happened by accident, all right? I think I can assume that. Um, many of us, if we're not careful, these names of God um, seem so, somewhat arbitrary or just kind of, well, it's just another name of God. When God very intentionally and specifically reveals himself through <laughs> these different names, these proper names. And so tonight we want to tackle this name uh, with the Lord's help, the name Adonai. As I mentioned on the onset tonight, you notice in verses 2 and verse number 8 that there is a new presentation of God, a new name of God, which is this name Adonai, capital L and then lowercase o-r-d. And so we want to talk about tonight what, what the name Adonai reveals to us about God 
and what that means for us in our day-to-day walk with Him. Tonight we want to talk about two questions that we have of God that we see asked by Abraham that the name Adonai answers. And these are questions that we all have, two questions specifically, that really God answer the, answers them with this name, uh, this name that He is sovereign, this name that He is Lord, and therefore the implications it has for us as a believer. The first question, if you will, go back to verse number two and notice what Abraham asks of God. He says, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? The steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Number one, first of all, the name Adonai answers the question, where is the divine, listen, where is the divine activation of what God has promised me? Where is the divine activation of what God has promised me? And I think if we are honest tonight, I think we know the promises of God. I think we at least sense maybe how those promises will be practically worked out in our lives, but we're still waiting on that to happen. Abraham here is now years, in fact, he's 10 years or more removed from the last time he's heard anything from God about the promise of this son which is to come from his own loins, uh, this son which is to embody and to fulfill the not just child promise, but the, the Messiah promises, the in thee all nations will be blessed promises, and he's, he hasn't heard anything. And he's wondering, and God tells him in verse number one, God, I am your, I am your shield, I am your exceeding great reward. And Abraham's thinking, I'm older than I was last time. You reminded me of that truth. And where's the activation? When are you going to do what you've promised you're going to do? And the name Adonai is the question, and, and notice that Abraham appeals to him as Lord, as sovereign. He is submitting, not questioning in the sense of, I don't know that you can do it, and I don't know if you're going to do it, just, God, will you do what you have promised to me? And so the name Adonai takes on special meaning in that area. A couple things I'd give you that the name Adonai activates for us as we trust and wait upon the Lord to fulfill the things that you maybe are waiting on Him tonight and I am as well. Number one, first of all, he gives to us a reminder of activated responsibility. Activated responsibility. I may give you a couple things very quickly under this that God alone is responsible for as Adonai. Number one, first of all, Adonai is the one responsible in the gift category. Who was going to give this son of promise? Abraham? Sarah? Eliezer, some other manufactured source? No, God was the one who had promised. It was God, therefore, who was going to give the gift that he had promised. God had promised Abraham that he was going to make of him a great nation. He was going to give to him an heir, an heir a child, even in his old age. And I find it interesting that God makes the promise as Yahweh or Jehovah. If you look back at verse number 1, the Lord came unto Abraham. This, this Jehovah God, the God of revelation, the one who self-reveals that we talked about a few weeks ago, is the God that now Abraham appeals to and calls him Adonai and asks for activation of the promise that had been revealed. And it, it kind of the light, to, to make this practical for us tonight, because last time I checked, you haven't had God appear to you probably in a dream or some other way, but this self-revelation of God would be as if you're in church or maybe you're in your, in your Word and the Word of God and you're reading, and God gives you a promise. And yet, it's only a promise. It's just on a page or it's just something you've heard and you've yet to see it and sense it and experience the full benefit of that promise being realized. And what's awesome about Adonai aspect of God is God is, is in control of the circumstances that have led you to the point you're at that have led you and allowed in your life the things that now to you may even seem as a hindrance to the fulfillment of those promises. And you notice here that Abraham appeals to him as Lord, as Adonai, asking for his intervention in his life. Abraham had heard what God had said. He knew God's plan and God's, God's purpose. And yet he appeals to God and asks God, God, you own me. God, you're in charge. And when are you going to do what you have promised? Um, you ever heard of a term called rationalism? It's a, it's a philosophy, uh, one that plagued our world in more prominence in days gone by. But rationalism basically reduces all reasoning to the human mind. 
If I can't understand it, if I can't see it, if I can't interact with it, it's not real. It's not relevant to my existence. Aren't you thankful that God promises us things, promises to give us things that are bigger than our mind? There goes heaven. There goes eternity if God can only do what can fit within our mind. And so God is He's so much bigger. And Adonai, Abraham said, God, I, I just want to know when. I just want to know how. I'm not saying you're not going to. And Adonai soothes our, our concerns and our questions and reminds us that God is Lord, that God is sovereign. He is sovereign in the area of the gift category. He's going to give us all things that He has promised to us. And so we need to trust in that as we look to the God called Adonai. Now, if you will, go down to verse number three. All right, so he asked the question, God gives the promise, and notice now the response of Abraham. And Abraham, or Abram said, behold, to me thou hast given, <laughs> excuse me, no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. Number two, secondly, Adonai is responsible in the area of generation. He's the one who generates the fulfillment. He's the one who brings out of nothing something. He's the one who brings to bear uh, the full import of His power to fulfill His promises. There's a story in the news uh, yesterday of four sisters, and they just broke a world record that became known uh, this past week. Together, these four sisters, their, their combined ages add up to 391 years. Two of the ladies are twins, and they're just over 100, and then you do the math, the other two ladies fill in the gaps, and 391 years between four siblings. It's a, it's an, a current standing world record. Do you ever feel like Abraham sometimes where you're at least in the twilight season of, of qualifying for that promise to be fulfilled? Maybe in your body or your finances or your, your family or some relational thing or maybe even a business thing or whatever? And I think in the story here, we find Abraham slipping into the mindset, maybe I am partly responsible to make it happen. Do you see that in verse 3? In fact, Ishmael, which is, continues to plague the Israelites to this day, that decision with Hagar to try to manipulate and to fulfill in his own means has led to continued uh, difficulty for God's people. And so Abraham thinks, may, maybe my reasoning, maybe my resources, my logic... It's going to help God fulfill the promise He's entrusted and offered to me. And I love the verse in Hebrews 11 and verse 12, which resonates with us men especially tonight. It says this, Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. That's how it describes Abraham. So many as the stars of the sky and multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. See, God, when He is Adonai, He, he can take nothing and create something out of it. He can take, as they would say, zeros and make heroes out of them. He can start with, with nothing and make something that brings glory and honors to His name. That's the Adonai. That's the God of Scripture. And I'm thankful He's that kind of Lord. He's that kind of God. Do we see Him as that tonight? Do we trust Him as that? You may be aware of this. Right now, our courthouse in downtown Worcester is going through a renovation. Have you observed that? The other day, there was an article in the news interviewing just people. What do you think about the fact it's costing $5.5 million to renovate that building? I mean, everybody's too much, it's too little, they should have done it 50 years ago, they should wait, you know, everybody's got their opinion of when and how much. But I'm glad I'm not getting that bill this weekend, aren't you? Just the, sca I couldn't pay to put the scaffolding that they've got strapped around that building. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't just offer things, but then He pays for them, He funds them, He empowers them? Don't forget Adonai. God that doesn't just promise, but a God also who fulfills and guarantees His own promises. All right, now if you will, go back to our text and look at verse number 5. So there's this activated responsibility. Abraham's tempted to do something, to become self-reliant, and Adonai, God says, no, wait a minute, just you rest in me. You let me activate. It's my job to start this thing and to finish it. Look now at verse number 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, notice this, look toward heaven. And tell the stars, if you be able to number them. By the way, God knew how many, what that number was when he asked Abraham. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Number two, not only does he give us activated responsibility, number two, he gives to us activated revelation. He gives to us activated revelation. 
The other day, I heard someone say they were looking through an old photo album. We just recently have been kind of reminiscing in our home. We watched an old home video the other night from the boys' first Christmas morning, some of those memories and just how young they looked, et cetera. And then we've been looking through photo albums. How many of you have been actively involved in putting pictures in photo albums in the last six months or so? It's kind of gone by the wayside, hasn't it? Now they're in our phones or whatever, and you, don't, you just don't look at them the same way. But the other day, someone said to me, they said, isn't it interesting, when you go through old photo albums, you never see pictures of what people are eating for lunch. Have you, have you noticed that? People are taking selfies of their food, you know, and who cares what you're eating for lunch? I mean, if I were to look through my grandparents' you know, photo albums and see pictures of what they ate in 1947, you know, at such and such cafe, it's ridiculous. Uh, things change. May I remind you this evening, God does not change. But what's interesting is, as we open our hearts and minds to Him, He reveals to us new truth, not changing something, but expanding our understanding and discernment of who He is and what He's all about. And so God can help us to understand His unchanging promises more completely, more perfectly when He is our Adonai. May I give you two things under this very quickly. First of all, number one, Adonai is revealing in the area of submission. Adonai is revealing in the area of submission. Notice Abraham's response to, to this revela revelation as God expands his focus. Abraham's looking at this old, or at least well-aged <laughs> well servant, Eliezer, and God says, would you quit looking at that? Let me expand what you see and what you know and how that applies to your life and to your future. And notice what Abraham does in response in verse 6. Beginning of verse 6, and he believed in the Lord. Notice, and it counted, and he counted it to him for righteousness. There was a belief, there was a submission to the revelation that God had given. And of everything we're going to look at tonight, this is a key part of our study. If you're waiting on God to reveal or to do something in your life, the thing that you have to do and you have to keep doing is you have to submit to God to see more to experience more of what He's promised in your life. The greatest hindrance to God doing what He's promised you is not God, it's not your circumstances, it's not who or what or whatever the details, it's you and it's me. And it is our outright rebellion and resistance against God in our heart, sometimes in a, sometimes in a very sophisticated way, with the veneer up that greatly hinders God doing and being what He wants to be in our lives. It is our lack of submission. Would it have been easier for God to give Abraham a child 10 years before Genesis 15? Physically speaking, yes. But Abraham wasn't ready 10 years before. And God is working and God is preparing him and breaking his will and revealing himself more completely to prepare Abraham to be ready for the giving and the fulfillment of the promises God had given to him. Adonai's thinking about more than just the present. And so was Abraham's submission to God as master, as ruler, and as owner that ultimately led to uh, this relationship going further between him and God. See, God must have the right to own you if he's going to take responsibility to do something with you. Does he own you tonight? Does he own your heart? Does he own your body? Does he own your life? What you do with your body matters. What you do with your mind and your mouth, every nuance and crevice of your being must be surrendered to Him so that He may give and do and be more in your life. It's not about manipulation. It's about intimacy. It's about closeness and surrenderedness to this God who is Adonai. You think about if you own something on this earth. If that thing you own is not under your control, you're not going to waste your time with it. If you own something, it's yours. It's yours to, 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 to move and to, to steward and to to, to change and tweak and improve, and that's when you get involved in something like that. And God's the same way. Yes, He created us and He redeemed us, but we voluntarily surrender to Him. And when He sees that, God shows up in that heart and in that life. I don't know if you're like me. I, I think I heard Brother Josh at our missions conference, Carney, getting a question from one of our missionaries who had forgotten the password to his little tablet. And he was trying to figure, now what do you do when that happens? You can't remember how to, if you struggle with passwords, some of us, we have business settings, I do, where you have to change your password every so often. 
I can't, my brain can't do that, okay? I just go back to the very, some of you guys know my simple passwords. They laugh at me, some of my very simple that involve the numbers one, two, three, and four, you know, in, in my own life, and just remembering those. You know what the password is to, to unlocking the power and presence of God in our lives? Submission. Surrendering to God. I want to give you a statement tonight that I would strongly encourage you to write down that continues to resonate and reverberate in my own heart, and I'd ask you to jot this down. Would you jot down this statement? Not original with me, but here's the statement. Quote, if you want to see God freely unleash His power in and through your life, if you want to see God freely unleash His power in and through your life, listen to this, never use no and God in the same sentence. If you want to unleash the power of God in and through your life, never use no and God in the same sense. You do that and you squelch and you shut down and you stifle the power of Adonai. God wants to be Lord and when He is Lord, He is powerful. His presence is sweet and significant in a special way. But it's when we say, God know this or God know that, that we lose and we miss out on what He could activate in our lives. And so Adonai is revealing in the, the context of our submission. And I hope like Abram, we would be willing to respond in like fashion. All right, now notice the end of verse number six, and we won't spend much time here, but notice what happens as a result of his submissive faith. And he, Abraham, notice, or and he, God, counted it, this belief in the Lord, to him for righteousness. Number two, Adonai is revealing in that he, number two, he saves us. He saves us. Go, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. And I find it interesting that the New Testament equivalent of this word Adonai is found in what is a very familiar gospel section of Scripture. Romans chapter number 10. And I don't want to get, go to seed on this tonight, but just a quick thought from Romans chapter 10. Would you go there? And let's begin in verse number 9. All right, so Adonai is revealing in submission. He shows up when he sees a submissive heart and mind and life and home and church. Number two, he is revealing in that he offers to us salvation. Abraham believed God. It was counted for him to, for righteousness. Uh, and he became the father of faith. Look, if you will, verse number nine. But that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord... And if you want, just make a note, that's the word kurios, which is a Greek word, and it would be the parallel word for Adonai, which is the Old Testament. So if you were to ask me in either Hebrew or Aramaic, as well as in Greek, the New and Old Testament equivalents, Adonai and kurios, or Lord, they would be very parallel. So we find the same word or expression used in this passage. If you will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus not just Jesus, but the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be, what? Saved. Where the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Skip down to verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we see this emphasis upon the salvation that comes through Christ being Lord. Now, the question I would ask you is this. I don't know if you've ever heard of a term called lordship salvation or not, uh, where there would be teaching that there has to be certain specific submission or hoops to jump through uh, to uh, validate or to merit um, the saving grace that God offers. Um, fickle things such as maybe external things or um, priorities or convictions that have to change prior to salvation. And I think all of us in the room, I hope, that's not what we believe about salvation, that it's anything plus or minus uh, from God's grace. It's simply by faith that we are saved. And so the question I would ask you tonight is, why is here in Romans 10 we see this confession of the mouth and the emphasis upon the Lord Jesus? Uh, in verse number 9, the Lord Jesus. In verse number 13, the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you look at almost any other passage in Scripture, and it puts boundaries around salvation as far as being passing from death to life as simply being faith, that that's the requirement. And I find it interesting here, Romans 10, that also talks about this confessing of the mouth. Now, can I just ask you a question? This may be something your brain needs to think on or meditate for a little bit. But if you go back to chapter 1, what category would the audience 
of the book of Romans fall into? And your two options are as follows. Unsaved is option one, or option two is saved. They're saved, right? The book of Romans, you go back to verse number three and four and five, and clearly Paul's saying, I'm talking to those who are sanctified, those who are redeemed. I'm writing this to believers. Now, here's the thought tonight. I'm not saying Romans 10 is not good for soul winning and, and teaching and admonishing those who are unsaved. In fact, he goes on to talk about us preaching it and sharing it so that they might hear it. But I believe tonight that the lordship of God, this curios or this Adonai aspect of our relationship with the Lord, has more to do with this life. I believe at the moment we confess Christ, we believe Christ to be our Savior, that we pass from death to life, and positionally, we have a place in heaven. Ephesians 2 is clear on that, right? Nothing can take, us from it, take it from us, nothing can compromise it. We, we, can, we can do everything we want to try to, not that we would want to, uh, but it is secure. But my point is this, there's a, instead of thinking of salvation as just from earth, someday I get heaven, in the future. I believe it is the lordship of God, it is the Adonai aspect of God that brings heaven to earth. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. What is the, one of the coolest, greatest things about heaven? God's in charge. He stops all wrong, He pushes it out, He ropes us in with walls, not prison walls, but garden walls that allow us to enjoy in a perfect environment the absolute lordship of who God is. And my point tonight is this, I think often the reason we're not experiencing God on a level that we should in this life is we're not letting Him into our life as Lord. He can save some things in our life. He can redeem some things. He can restore some things. But He's not going to do that for the person who's resisting Him, the person who's fighting Him. He wants to save. He wants to deliver the person who recognizes Him as Adonai, who recognizes Him as Lord. And so to receive the full benefits of salvation... Not just in eternity, but now. It involves believing in Jesus, yes, as Savior, but also receiving and submitting to Him as Lord. And I'd ask you just to think about that, meditate upon that, where in your life Jesus is Savior, but often He is not the Lord that He should be. All right, number two, let's spend a few minutes now in the last half of our chapter. Go back to Genesis 15. And we could spend more time in that section tonight, but we will not. Look, if you will, at verse number eight. Uh, let's begin in verse 7. And he said, uh, excuse me, he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Notice verse 8. Now we have the second occurrence in Scripture of the name Adonai. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? All right, so the name Adonai answers the first question, which is, God, where is your divine activation? When are you going to launch this thing? Are we just going to sit on the pad and have the countdown continue forever? And the name Adonai assures us that at some point God will activate His promises. I believe that. Everything God has yet to do in your life that He's promised, it, let's not debate whether He's going to or not. Let's trust. Let's yield. Let's wait upon Him with faith and patience. All right, number two. Second question is this. Where is the divine affirmation? The divine affirmation. I find one of the greatest things about, hardest things about waiting upon God is, is not the waiting. Um, it, it's, not, it's not in the moment. It's knowing in the waiting that I'm actually waiting on something that's going to happen. Does that make sense to you? Um, I, I think any of us are willing to wait for a good meal as opposed to pop it in the microwave and stand there and watch it for three minutes. You know, we understand the value of waiting when something's going to come at the end of that. And I love the fact, think about how much God affirms His promises. He could just say to us one time, I just find He keeps sending prophets. He keeps sending new books of the Bible. He keeps giving to us things that we see in these 66 books. Just affirming, affirming, affirming. And so Abraham says, Lord, as Adonai, don't just activate it, but right now while I'm waiting on you to do that, affirm those promises. Convince me again. Remind me again that you truly are going to follow through on what you've offered. And in verse number 8, he asked for that, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? The other day, my boys, they, my boys are getting the stage now. They don't have cool initials like yours, Brother Alan. You were out when I said that, I think, of C-A-T. We're not that creative. But anyway, my boys are getting the stage where I've caught a little bit of sarcasm. I don't know where they get that from. I have no idea. Um, 
But the other day, someone sent me a link to a YouTube video uh, of a, that's, a, that's dangerous, just that. But anyway, someone sent me a link to a YouTube video of a guy, a guy you could tell from his, his, his dialect, he's from Russia, all right, would be my guess, or the Ukraine or somewhere like that. And uh, the video is a two minute video and it has this heading, how, uh, how to change a hubcap on a Toyota Camry 2011 or something like that. I think I said it to Paul as well. But this guy, he can't even, he can't even speak English and he's doing a how-to video. It literally, all it is is him taking a hubcap, popping it on a Camry, and he goes into great detail about watch out for the air nozzle and this, and you can't even understand him. Well, I don't know why it struck my funny bone, but I'm watch, just laughing and, Dad, let's watch it again. And then they would watch me as I'm, I can't breathe. You know, I'm just watching this thing, just <laughs> laughing my head off, the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I don't know who this guy is, but someone stuck a camera in his face and said, you know something, tell the world about it. Have you ever had someone maybe affirm you and you kind of know it's just because they like you or they want to say what you want heard? God, God's not that way. When God validates something, when God affirms something, he means it. And I love to have God affirm his promises in my life. Not me, not someone else I know, but from the lips of the guy, the God who gave it, comes the confirmation. And that's what Abraham longed for. You'll notice here in our text tonight that Abraham is not demanding a sign in order to believe. He's already believed in verse 6. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God, or Abraham wants a sign related to the faith something tangible, something that he can rest on in moments when he does doubt and when he does get questions from family or others that he can point to and say, God has affirmed the promises that he offered to me. And I'm thankful that Adonai obliges that desire in our hearts. Now, notice a few things that he affirms. First of all, he affirms establishment. He affirms an establishment, a foundation upon which he's to build. <laughs> he is going to build the promise he's given. Two things I would give you very quickly under that, <laughs> excuse me, number one, first of all, there is an establishing of contrast. Do you notice what, what God says in verse number seven? He says, unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And so there is a distinction that God's character, God's person is different than the gods of this world. Why did God bring Abraham out of the Ur of the, Chal out of Ur of the Chaldees? Because of the gods in Ur the gods of the Chaldees. And so he brought him out to build a singular, exclusive relationship with him. And I will tell you, though the gods of this world, their promises are empty at best, our God is not like that. He follows through on every detail, every nuance of what he's offered. By the way, before we move on very quickly, would you go to the book of Isaiah? And this is just a little rabbit trail. Brother Yoder and I were talking about this past week. And he brought something out that I thought was significant to our study tonight that have thought on it further since. And just give you a quick thought. Isaiah chapter 6, that speaks to the contrast between the gods of this world and the promises of those gods and the promises and person of who our God is. Isaiah chapter 6, and if you would please, verse number 1. Brother Yoder and I were talking the other day about, and he was pointing out, he asked the question, as most good teachers do, and then let me fumble through an answer before he gave me the right answer. He asked me the question, he said, why does Isaiah 6 begin with, in the year that King Uzziah died? Why is that even included? Um, do we really know much about Uzziah? Does it really bear much upon the passage? And I find it interesting. Notice it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. What name of God is that? Adonai. Notice, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And I don't want to get into the revelation and the, 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 just the vision that Isaiah had, but my point is, in answering that question, why, why does it include that King Uzziah died, and that's when uh, the prophet Isaiah saw God high and lifted up. And here's just the thought that Brother Yoder gave and then just a little further application of that that God's been teaching me. I believe, and I agree with Brother Yoder, I think it's because God was trying to contrast himself with the king that up until a certain point just prior to Isaiah 6, Isaiah had great respect for this king. 
What did Uzziah do that boxed him in, that limited him, and ultimately led to his destruction? He walked into the temple as king and began to act in a way that only the priest had a right to do. He lost his reverence and respect for God. You remember what happened? God smote him with what? Leprosy. And Uzziah died in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1 with leprosy. And it was in that moment that Isaiah saw God, the Lord, Adonai specifically, high and lifted up. And here's the little application I would give you tonight in that area. I have found God will often take people or personalities or things that we trust in, and He will remove them and show us we can still survive, we can still thrive, and in fact, it's never going to be better than it is after we lose our focus on those things and those people and we focus upon the Lord. I love that. Have you ever lost maybe a, a, an influence in your life, maybe not through death, but just broken relationship or something comes up and God uses that loss or at least that pause in that relationship to remind you they can never do and be for you what I can do and be for you? And it's often the seasons of great loss. I know that's easy to preach in church. It's hard to live, but God can use that in our lives to remind us that He's different. He's special. And in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah got a glimpse of God he never had before. And I find it interesting that it's Adonai. That in that moment, he had clarity he had never had before as his gaze moved from the king, had failed him, and he focused upon God who was glorious. By the way, Abraham had the same experience, and we just read that. He had to leave Ur to know God and to experience His precious uh, provision and lordship in his life. Um, I don't know if you have in your family a man who is renowned for not asking directions, will not stop and ask directions when he's driving. Maybe I should ask, does anyone have one in your family that does stop? Maybe that'd be the better question. I I've done it. You know, no, we're fine, dear. It's only been an hour. I'll figure it out. And you just keep... Did we see that before? Yes, that's the third time we've seen that stop sign. You know, and you just, you keep just, if I go long enough, I'll figure it out. I love the verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, describing Abraham as he trusted God and left everything he knew. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. That sounds like a lot of us guys sometimes, but that was Abraham. He just went. He just followed God. And God reminds him of that here in our chapter of Genesis 15. The question I would ask you tonight, I want you to think about this. What could God do if we would focus less on knowing the how? How God's going to do what He's promised. And we would focus more on knowing the who has promised. Less on the how, more on the who. And I think if we would do that, our faith would be renewed, our confidence would be affirmed, and we would continue to put our faith and trust in that God. All right, now if you will, go back to our text in Genesis 15 and notice a few verses beginning in verse number 8. Genesis 15 and now verse 8. He asked the question, verse 8, <laughs> excuse me, notice now verse 9, he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took them unto him all these, and divided them in the mist, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Number two, God also establishes not just a contrast between him and other gods, but number two, he establishes a covenant. He establishes a covenant. And not to get into this at great length, but just so you understand why in the world are they cutting animals in half? For some of you, that really hyper offends you tonight, maybe. Um, but uh, why were they doing this? Well, it was a ceremony. Often they would do when two parties would commit to something. They would cut these animals that you see described here. They would cut them in half, and they would create a path between the two parts. And then whoever was binding themselves to that commitment, instead of signing it you know, with ink before a lawyer or signing it with their own blood, they, they had this path between the animals and the parties that were committed, they would together walk between them. And it was a whoever passed between that, now their, their resources, their, their activities, their priorities were built around keeping that covenant they just made. Now I want you to notice what happens after Abraham falls asleep. Go down, if you will, to verse number 17. 
come back to those verses if we have time in just a moment. Verses 13 to 16. But look at verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that, pa- uh, that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, with Abram. And it's interesting that Abraham's sleeping, so he's not walking between the pieces. It's only God. And I remind you tonight that everything God has promised us ultimately rests upon who He is alone. Does that give you hope tonight? Does that give you peace tonight? Your ups and downs, and I know there are prerequisites to certain promises and fulfillments God has given. If you will do this, I will do this. I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying where God says, I'm promising you something. It's not compromised by who you are or who you're not. It's not, it's not added to by who you are or who you're not. It just rests upon who He is. Abraham's asleep. God's walking between these pieces, committing His character, binding Himself to the promise that He had offered to Abraham. Adonai, I love how immediately he responds and gives this validation of the promise that has been offered. Note that in this one symbol passing through the pieces, it speaks to the covenant of grace that God has made with, made with us, not between two, not based upon two, but a promise that's confirmed by God alone. <laughs> Excuse me, I think we have time to look at it and my voice will let me. Would you go to 1 Peter chapter 3? Let me give you one other example in the New Testament that fleshes out this idea of Adonai just a bit more that also involves the man uh, Abraham, Abraham. 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 6. And I'm sure for you ladies tonight, this is your life verse. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 6. Um, and just a thought from this verse tonight. Hebrews chapter 3, or I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 6. After talking about the quiet and meek spirit and chaste conversation, in verse number 6, it uses the illustration of these same two folks, Sarah and Abraham, that we've been reading about in Genesis 15. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him, notice this next word, Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do dwell and are not afraid with amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And I know, I doubt any of you guys have recently got Lord and your name, you know, and, and anything like that vibe-wise from your wife. If you have, I'd like to know the secret. But anyway, uh, I, I probably were our own worst enemy, us guys. We don't deserve to be considered in that category um, intrinsically. But the idea is that Sarah recognized and respected Abraham. Now, here's the thought tonight. Why did she respect Abraham? Remember what Abraham did to Sarah? Several times he said she was his sister. She ends up in some harems and confusion and just crazy situations that he put her into. So Abraham was not the perfect husband. He was the father of faith and did a lot of great things for the Lord. But in his relationship with her at times, he really made some foolish decisions. I believe that the spirit she had toward Abraham with this word Lord, which again is a parallel word to what we're talking about tonight, is that she knew Abraham owned the responsibility of taking care of her. And she was willing to call him Lord, not so much in the area of you know, subjecting and, and submitting to just for the sake of groveling before him, but she called him Lord and she actually liked to do it. She, it was a, a name that she directed to him because it reminded her that Abraham owned the responsibility. And it has the idea of ownership. And the thought I would give you tonight in this area of, of, of God being our covenant God is ultimately He owns our life. He owns our family. He owns our future. And because He does, don't, don't resent that. Rejoice in that. That means He's responsible. He owns me. He, he has to take care of me. He has to provide for me. And we have our part, but it's ultimately His responsibility. And so this lordship of God, this Adonai aspect of God, means ultimately it rests solely and entirely upon Him. See, ownership has much more to do with responsibility than mere dominion. 
God in His rules, Adonai fulfills these responsibilities of ownership. He protects us. He per, uh, provides for us. He guards us. He leads us. He cares for us. And the list goes on and on and on. And so glory in the Lordship. I, I, I've heard many times, you know, submit to God, and it's kind of this negative feel to it. We get to submit to God. We get to trust our everything to Him. Our kids, our grandkids, our future, our eternity, it's His. And we can rest in that. There's a beauty to the Lordship of God in our lives. And I think it's been tainted and it's been twisted and distorted when it is a beautiful, enriching aspect of our lives. God, I think I know what's best for me, but I know You own me. I know You own everything about me. And I can rest in that. You are truly my Adonai. And so let God own you tonight. Let God be the one responsible ultimately for who and what you are. All right, now lastly, go back to our text and notice the second affirmation that God does to Abraham in the few minutes that we have left. Look at verse 13. <laughs> Excuse me. And before he gets to the lamp and all that goes with passing through these animal parts, notice what he says to Abraham in verse 13. He said to Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve, shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And several times in Scripture you'll see God approximate things. We know the, te the, the technical amount was what? 430 years was, was the span of that slavery, but he's using round numbers, and we see that several times in Scripture. It's not a contradiction. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy father in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And so secondly, there's an affirmed, not just establishment, but number two, an affirmed, ex uh, and should be affirmed, sorry there, an affirmed expansion, where God expands what Abraham knows. Think about it. Abraham is none of the Scripture. He, he has none of what we have. I and mean, we have so much more than Abraham does as far as the concrete absolutes of God's Word. And God gives to him more revelation. He expands his understanding through this conversation that leads to affirmation. Um, there was a hysterical video the other day um, that came out of China, mainland China, of a guy, a construction worker, construction worker driving a little like van bus, you know, like the Euro type buses, and it technically was only supposed to have six people in it. It had six seats. And they had the dash cam or like the cam on the, the, the police officer as he walked up to the van and he opens the door up and they just start filing out. There were 50 people in a six passenger van, 50 people in there. And it was just, and they just kept coming. And I was watching it thinking, this has got to be a joke. There's got to be like an open door on the other side and they're just looping around or something. 50 people in a six passenger van. Do you know that God is doing something much bigger than whatever you think is the best case scenario right now? Do you know that? Do I know that? God was about ready to bless the planet. He was about ready to bless not just the people of that day, but people and generations to come through this man Abraham. And he begins to expand his understanding and to, to push back the edges of what he knew to that point and to reveal to him that there was more going on than what Abraham was thinking. And I believe one of the greatest hindrances in our relationship with a God who is big, to say the least, is our small-mindedness, our short-sightedness. We act like toddlers sometimes, don't we? Let's be honest tonight. We kick and scream and whine with the little thing right in front of us. It's big to us, but little in God's scheme of things. We resist it. We resent that it's not going our way. And God gives us context to that situation through His revelation. Now quickly, you're in chapter 15. Go to chapter 17. And notice verse number 5. When God expands who this man Abraham is and the promise that He's offered to him. Genesis 17 and verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be, called, shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. All right, he's just trying to be the father of one boy, isn't he? Just one boy. And God says, I've changed your name. Before he ever gives the first son, he gives him this name change. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. 
And I will give unto thee and thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so we see that God gives to Abraham two things to expand in this area of affirmation. All Abraham wanted to know was, am I really going to have a son? And God affirms it, but he affirms it in a much grander and glorious fashion. Two things. First of all, he offers to us uh, an expansion in the area of information. And I touched on that already. God expanded the information that God had to that point given to this man, Abraham. Um, the phrase, in thee shall all nations be blessed, you realize that has messianic implications, right? That through the seed of Abraham would come the Messiah. And the question I'd ask you tonight is this, think about the personal benefit that we receive tonight because there's time between the promise and the fulfillment. There was a, a time frame between Abraham receiving the promise and his son, but there was a whole pile of years between Isaac and the next generation, and then the Messiah who came, and, and now we here tonight, we're still benefiting because God takes time to fulfill His promises. And it's glorious that God is steady, and many times His wheels turn slowly because it includes new people. It includes new aspects, and God knows that, and God's reminding Abraham of that. So God's faithfulness over time, His fulfillment in a steady but often slow manner allows us to experience more of who He is and what He's offered to us. And so the waiting period between the offer and the fulfillment gave great opportunity for Abraham to get to know God more. Now I want to ask you this. If Abraham had gotten the son before Genesis 15, do you think he would have listened to God the way he did in chapter 15? No. This was a special season that he could never go back to between the promise and the fulfillment where God was daily revealing something to Abraham, even in the waiting. God was showing him something. God was teaching him something. Instead of whining and resisting and woe is me, can I encourage us all tonight to look to God and learn from Him and say, God, show me something in this. Reveal more of who you are. You are my Adonai. You have a purpose for holding back. There's a reason, there's a, a principle, there's a lesson that I can learn. So Abraham learned much, and God expanded his understanding in this season of waiting. Now let's end by going back to the end of the chapter, beginning in verse 18. And notice what else God expands to the understanding and delight of Abraham, beginning in verse 18. The same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. From the river of Egypt, uh, the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, uh, the Kenizzites, uh, and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephiams, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And so he lists these different residents that are going to be displaced by the descendants of Abraham in the promised land. Number two, and lastly, Adonai often expands in the area of his intentions, what specifically he's going to do. One of the things that I love about God that I see often in Scripture is He doesn't just come out of nowhere and do something. Have you noticed this about God? He tells us what He's going to do before He does it. Why, why does God work that way? What does He often speak to our heart before He actually moves in some situation? Why does He affirm something and then later follows through it? Because He wants us to know when He does it that He's the one that did it. Hey, I told you I was going to do that. Have you ever reminded somebody of something that you do for them that you told them you were going to do for them? It connects your character. It, con uh, it connects your, your concern and your interest in their life by following through on what you said you're going to do. And so God reveals His intentions to Abraham. He names specific nations He's going to push out. He names specific locations where His descendants would experience the promises of God. And I find it interesting that it is in this waiting period that Abraham learns much. You think his descendants heard the words that he heard from God later? They would have never known. They would have never heard of where they were going and what God was going to do without this chapter of waiting. And God revealed his intentions and what he had planned for them. See, Adonai always has a grand purpose connected to his promise. And when he has a purpose connected to his promise, which isn't just to fulfill your whims and desires... He wants you to know that purpose before He gives the promise. And so we need to look to God, not just for the fulfillment of the promise, but God, what are your intentions? What, what's your plan? What's your purpose? Prepare me for it. 
As we finish tonight, there was a story in the news this last week, and I don't mean this in any way in a joking way. It's a, it's a sad story. Last I heard, it's still been confirmed, the, the uh, current dictator in North Korea, I don't know if you know much about him or the situation, a sad uh, situation, the impoverishment, the spiritual darkness, et cetera, that's there. But in, in a recent meeting that he had, in fact, the meeting I think was held in April, his defense minister, I don't know if you saw this story or not, as they're in meeting, fell asleep while this dictator was doing whatever he was doing during his meeting as the sovereign, as the Lord of his country. And because this man fell asleep and when he was confronted, he disrespected the leader, Kim Jong-un or whatever, I can't remember, I think that's how you say his name. He took the man, condemned him to death, put him in front of an anti-aircraft artillery installment and shot the guy through repeatedly in front of everyone else. Now how about you, I'd stay awake at the next meeting, all right? That would be my own thought. I'd probably move first. But he took the guy out because he was a threat in some way he perceived to his authority. And I want you to think about that image tonight of that's, that's the alternative to the Lord of the Bible. There's an author I was reading recently. He said this, listen to these words, quote, when you don't surrender to the Lord, you surrender to chaos. That's why there's so many problems that appear in our lives. We seek our own way and our own will. Yet when we surrender to Adonai, we surrender to the fulfillment of our destiny. So throw up the white flag of surrender to the Lordship of Christ and begin to enjoy being owned by Him. And I love that statement. When we surrender to anyone else than Adonai, we surrender to chaos. Does your life feel like it's kind of out of control tonight? Does it feel like it's just coming out from underneath you? Somewhere there's a disconnect between you and Adonai. The centeredness, the calmness, the steadiness in the midst of absolute chaos and turmoil is when you're resting and relying upon Adonai. Is your God, not just Elohim, not just Jehovah, is He Adonai tonight? Does He own you? Let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the example of this man Abraham. The man God that was the first man, is at least recorded in Scripture, that from his lips ushered this name Adonai.